Thank you much, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have heard a little bit about um, about um, uh, questions, uh, mechanical vars, biological vars. We have heard about uh, um, new kind of ideas about how vars can be assessed. And uh, I have um, uh, the uh, I have been asked to talk to you about uh, what do the guidelines say about how treatment for aortic valve disease should be done in these days. Um, as you all know, um, the guidelines have been uh, the guidelines for the treatment of valvular the heart disease have been rewritten and published in uh, 2017 in uh, the European Surgical Journal and the European Heart Journal. And uh, the guidelines were uh, written by a mixed group of surgeons, cardiologists all over Europe uh, under the leadership of Volkmar Falk, um, representing EX, and um, Helmut Baumgartner representing ESC. In terms of uh, what is new in the guidelines, uh, I haven't placed anything about mechanical and biological valves because, as people rightly say, there is nothing new about this. The age cutoff point is the same like it was in the past. I just add this here because uh, I thought it's maybe not a bad idea. The cutoff age for aortic valves is actually seen 60 years of age. Um, for um, uh, biological valves in the mitral position, it's 65, but in the aortic valve position, it's uh, 60 years of age. But there are a number of changes, and the number of changes are um, uh, uh, happened because of more availability of um, um, diagnostics to identify patients um, with aortic valve stenosis um, who may have no symptoms. You see this on the uh, left here. Um, but um, uh, they also were made because there is more evidence and that transcatheotic valve implantation um, uh, will stay and has a role in the treatment of aortic valve stenosis. Um, I will not talk much about um, uh, the diagnostics in patients without symptoms, but as you know, exercise testing um, has um, uh, become uh, uh, more important and uh, it's nowadays easier to identify patients who have maybe not so um, strong symptoms but have severe aortic valve stenosis and therefore would benefit from surgical treatment. There is actually no evidence for patients who are asymptomatic that they benefit from TAVI. So there's only evidence for asymptomatic patients that they benefit from surgery. On the other hand, what is definitely new is on the right side of this um, graph, and, um, and all has to do with the risk of patients. And uh, it is very clear that if patients have low risk for surgical treatment, they should uh, directly go into a surgical direction as long as there are no other major um, uh, factors um, uh, um, which, uh, which uh, would speak against that. But uh, there is a big group of patients of intermediate and high risk um, which is seen to benefit from um, a so-called heart team discussion so that the optimal treatment uh, can be identified in these patients. You know that uh, the heart team um, has maybe existed since, um, since um, heart sur and cardiac surgery uh, existed because you had heart teams in a lot of centers working before the term was created. But the term was created to make people aware that there is a need um, um, uh, of communication between interventional cardiologists and surgeons. Um, and when it comes to TAVI, there is a need to, to involve also people who uh, may benefit um, to, the, um, uh, to the treatment of the patients, like imaging specialists, anesthetists, care of the elderly uh, consultants as well. This is uh, nowadays recognized in the guidelines in a way that um, it is recognized that if you want to have a center which is calling itself a heart valve center, it should have a heart team. That should mean that departments of cardiology and cardiac surgery are on site, but it also means that there is an appropriate structural collaboration between them because just existing um, uh, um, uh, close to each other um, doesn't mean anything. There must be some communication, and that is a class one recommendation. When it comes to treatment of patients, as it often is in life, um, it is often black, when it comes to black and white here, low risk and high risk um, for um, surgical treatment, it is maybe easier to identify the best kind of um, uh, um, treatment option. So what I mean by that is surgical um, valve um, replacement, replacement has been seen as a class one indication in patients of low surgical risk. That means here SDS or Euroscore score two of less than 4% or low statistic your score of less than 10 percent and um, that is again a class one recommendation and TAVI has been seen as a treatment option in patients who are not suitable for surgical treatment so um, as a bailout kind of treatment option in patients who are not feasible to have surgery however there is a large group of patients 
uh, which is of intermediate risk. Actually, when you look at your own surgical cohorts, you may find that actually the intermediate risk group is not as large as some of the cardiologists would like to make us believe. Um, but nevertheless, for these intermediate risk patients, it is um, seen to be advantageous that they are discussed by heart teams, that the individual patient characteristics are assessed, and therefore, based on the characteristics of the patients, the um, optimal treatment um, modality can be determined. And that's, again, a class one indication. If you look um, into the studies which have been used to um, get evidence of intermediate risk patients, for example, the PARTNER2 trial, it's quite interesting to see that actually only elderly patients above 70 years were, um, were included. The STS score had um, uh, to be higher than four. And, um, but in the end, the mean age in these intermediate risk um, um, trials was above 80 years of age. Uh, the mean SDS score was 5.8. 24% of these patients had previous um, uh, cardiac surgery, most of the time bypass surgery, and 45% um, of the patients were classified to be frail. So actually, the intermediate risk patients, which are called intermediate risk, they may not be as low risk as one thinks or as one fears. However, the important thing is that the heart team has been placed into the center of the, um, of the decision-making process about the treatments. And the question then, of course, was how can you structure a heart team discussion to a degree that actually um, you have some kind of cornerstones to, to um, make people aware what they need to discuss and actually how complete it has to be. And that's the reason why we came up with a a list of clinical um, uh, um, uh, um, characteristics with a list of technical anatomical aspects for the procedure and also with a list of comorbidities you can treat with surgery at the same time and place those into a, a, uh, um, uh, a, um, a characteristic, um, uh, characteristics um, um, uh, form which actually um, differentiates between characteristics which favor a TAVI procedure or characteristics which favor a surgical aortic valve replacement. And you find this uh, in, the, in the guidelines. And this is used, and this is meant to be used not in a way that you focus on one um, uh, characteristic and then say, okay, that patient should have surgery uh, or TAVI. No, it is meant that you go through this list and identify the various factors. And in the end, after you've done that as a heart team, you have a better understanding do you have maybe a patient in whom more of the TAVI criteria are favored or more of the surgical criteria are favored? And I just want to go with you through this kind of list. And as you can see here, if you have, um, if you have a low SDS or Euro score, less than 4%, logistic Euro score 1, and less than 10%, uh, you are most likely a patient who benefits, um, uh, will more benefit from surgery. If you have a higher risk, you may benefit from TAVI. If you have certain comorbidities, um, which are not reflected in the scores. Let's say, for example, we have severe um, uh, lung um, problems, yeah? severe impaired lung function, which is not in the real scores. You may be a patient who actually benefit from uh, a TAVI procedure. Age plays a role because, as you have seen, there's not much of evidence um, that TAVI is good for young patients. And if you are less than 75 years of age, you are, should be more considered for surgery than for TAVI and um, vice versa. If you had previous cardiac surgery, that is something which um, may be helpful to answer with a TAVI because you can reduce the surgical trauma. If you are frail, if you have restricted mobility, recovery may be easier. On the other hand, if you have severe endocarditis, if you have endocarditis, not even severe, you should not or cannot be treated with a TAVI procedure. It is quite interesting to see um, how many young patients we treat because a lot of people, and particularly cardiologists, think aortic valve disease is a disease of the, uh, of the elderly. But if you look into the UK data, and this is only data until 2008, now I think it has even more swung in this direction. Um, at that time, 74% of patients treated in the UK with surgery for aortic valve and disease were um, below 75 years of age. So the vast majority of patients is much younger. Doability plays a major role, and that's again, if you are 75, yeah, you have um, you have maybe um, five or eight years to go. But if you're 65, you have uh, uh, 15 years to go. 
Um, and that's the reason why it is so important for, uh, for our surgery, surgical discussions uh, and for the surgical community to have long-term outcome data. And it is important to recognize that we have this for certain valves. And sometimes um, this needs to be used. In hard team discussion, it needs to be used. A lot of cardiologists are not aware or may not want to be aware about these outcomes. But I think that is something we need to stress in these discussions. I mentioned anatomical technical aspects. Uh, there are a number of, um, uh, um, of um, uh, anatomical aspects which are seen to favor TAVI approaches. If you have a straightforward, easy transfemoral TAVI, that is the best situation you can have, and that um, favors TAVI. On the other hand, um, uh, surgery may be a better option. If you have certain problems like porcelain aorta, um, uh, previous chest radiation, or you had um, previous grafts implanted, as we have seen before, you expect prosthetic patient mismatch or severe chest deformation, um, may make the surgery more difficult. You may think about more likely in the TAVI direction. On the other hand, if you have certain um, morphology um, uh, anatomy on the, um, on the aortic root and the aortic valve, like uh, um, short distance coronary arteries, uh, the size of the annulus, aortic move morphology, bicuspid valves, um, thrombus material on the valve, then the surgery uh, may be the much better option. And, um, and it is important to look at these various things during the heart team discussion. And then, of course, comorbidities. It is important to recognize that if you do an aortic valve, you can do revascularization, you can do another valve, you can do the aortic root, which particularly is an important um, point in younger patients, and you also um, can address um, the septal hypertrophy. But the most important thing is that you, for all these kind of um, uh, um, um, concomitant procedures, have your outcome data there. And you need to have this there during the discussion with the cardiologist. Because if you, if you don't have your data, they will say, well, actually, um, if you have double valve disease and mitral valve, and mitral valve at the same time and you're uh, older than 75 years, that's a very high mortality. And um, for example, our third day mortality in these patients at King's in 75 years and older is 7%. From my point of view, a little bit too high, but it is 7%. So we can use this data in there. Or we talk about bicuspid aortic valve and say, oh, root replacement, that's a high risk operation. And I can tell them, well, we had um, no mortality in root replacement since 2004 for the indication of bicuspid aortic valve disease. So there's not much they can say against that. Or you have combined procedures and do bypass at the same time, and they come up with some kind of data they have read somewhere and say the mortality is high, 5 to 8%. And you can say our mortality is 1.2%. And you are putting yourself into a, um, into a position where it's easier to have uh, sensible discussions. Um, the way we have tried to implement the guidelines I believe maybe a little bit earlier than, uh, than after they were published, is that we have multidisciplinary outpatient clinics already with the cardiologists together so that we can direct um, pathways very early. Uh, we have disease-specialized MDTs for aortic valve and mitral valve um, to also address the other um, comprehensive services we have. Multimodality cardiac imaging of controlled standard comprehensive treatment options, um, so that we we are not only able to do to offer one kind of surgery, we can offer limited access surgery, endoscopic surgery, whatever you want to do. You can you can offer stentless valves or whatever you need, think is the best kind of treatment for the individual patients. And we discuss our local outcome data. Therefore, I would like to conclude that surgical interventional treatment options for patients with aortic stenosis are steadily improving. Key for individualized patient care is an appropriate evaluation of these treatment options by the heart team, including cardiologists and surgeons. And heart team discussions need to be held with the local outcome data achieved in mind. Otherwise, they do not make any sense. Thank you much for your attention.